Hi, this is Jamie Broderick. I'm a visibility coach and I'm also the founder of Network Now. And today I am thrilled to have as my VIP guest, Carol Roth. She is a billion dollar deal maker, an entrepreneur, the creator of the Future File Legacy Planning System, a best-selling author. <laughs> Can we see that? Yeah. And a TV personality, including a contributor on CNBC and a judge on Mark Burnett's reality competition show, America's Greatest Makers, which airs Tuesday nights on TBS. Hi, Carol. Hi, Jamie. How are you? I'm excellent. So I'm so thrilled that you're here. I really appreciate it. I know you're a very busy lady. <laughs> yes, I'm glad we could uh, get our calendars to coordinate. Yes, and I'm glad Blab decided to get back online for us. So <laughs> the, God, the tech gods are on our side, at least for the moment. <laughs> we'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. Sorry, somebody's calling me. Ah, the whole thing just went crazy over here because my <laughs> phone started vibrating. Okay, I'm back. Okay, so let's let's just launch right into it just in case we get cut off right um all right i have a network of women entrepreneurs a lot of them struggle with building a viable business they are as you call it a lot of them are jobbies which yes. you talk about in your book which is they create a job for themselves rather than building a business so you want to start with that topic perhaps uh, sure. So uh, I, uh, this is a, a topic that afflicts many entrepreneurs, but I think women in particular, and that's that they don't think big enough. That when you have a wonderful idea or you have the idea to leave corporate America, wh whatever the impetus is to start this business, that you really set it up to be entirely dependent on you. And while most businesses um, do require that the entrepreneur wear all the hats to begin with, there needs to be some plan to eventually make that business scalable, to lessen the dependency on you for the execution of it and have you drive the vision and make it bigger. Otherwise, if you get hit by the bus, there is no more business. Uh, if you go to sell it, you have created no assets or nothing of value in order to sell. So you've really just created a job for yourself. And what research has found is that entrepreneurs that really have these jobbies, so to speak, um, end up working more hours with more stress for the same or perhaps less pay than if they just had a job working for someone else where they could focus on that one thing that they really enjoy doing. And instead you set yourself up for this, this new construct. So I think it's really important um, to think bigger, to think more scalable um, you know, as early as possible. And certainly a lesson that I learned uh, early on and something that I, I certainly encourage many people to do. Yes, very well said. You've said it a few times, I'm sure. <laughs> just a couple. <laughs> just a couple. Yeah, somebody today was just asked, saying that they were drowning, they were bleeding, that they just can't keep up, they're so overwhelmed. And uh, one thing I know that wherever you're struggling in business is where you need systems. This woman I know, Kelly, who was part of the Conquer Club, said that the other day. And it is so true. If you don't have systems and processes set up, you're really not building on a good foundation. And then if you try to do it all yourself rather than having a team, like you said, you've created a job. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the other thing is just having a comfort level with doing something well enough to make your customers happy, but not necessarily perfectly or not necessarily the way that you do it. And I think that that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, that I'm so good at doing this and nobody can replicate it. Well, that's true, but if you wanna build your business, it doesn't matter. You have to get past that. And if it's good enough for your client to be happy or your customer to be happy, then it needs to become good enough for you. And that is a very, very difficult thing to do. It's very simple, but it's also very difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about what is the value most and how can you easily deliver it? Least resources, biggest impact is what yeah. I like to say. <laughs> yeah. So another term that you use, which I find hysterical, is business slut. Yes. Which is somebody, somebody that gives their business services away for free or significantly <laughs> uh, charges less than their true value, 
So I see yeah. that all the time too. People are lowering their prices and competing on price and afraid to raise them because they're afraid they'll lose all their customers. Never compete on price. Always compete on value. The, the customers who just want the best price aren't going to be loyal to you anyway. So that that's just um, turning a business trick if we want to keep it the same thing here. And it gets you a little bit of money, but it doesn't really help you to sustain your business. I also find, um, strangely enough, that the people who tend to care the most amount about money tend to be big um, pains in the butt as well. So it, it could be a good screening tool. But I think that there is a, a fear, and again, um, not to beat up on the women today, but uh, since that's the, the primary group we're speaking with, I, I think that that is a particular issue for women um, to feel confident enough that they can charge more. And so, you know, I just advocate doing a lot of research, finding out what other people are charging and feeling free to, to throw some numbers out there that you might think are crazy and see what the feedback is and, you know, test the waters. And if it doesn't work, you can readjust. Um, but, you know, certainly much, much easier to do a few higher paying gigs than a whole bunch of lower paying ones. And you can build off the type of customers who are willing to pay more once you get a sense of, you know, where that, that price and value proposition uh, crosses. But I, I certainly think that there are far too many women who undercharge for their services. And, you know, it's a problem with women all around, women who don't work volunteer all the time in, in different organizations and their kids' schools and are giving away their genius and not being properly compensated for it. So I think it, it tends to be a bad habit that just sort of carries over to business. And, um, you know, particularly in the service area where it may be a little bit more difficult to find those benchmarks versus, you know, consumer product, you can go and see what else is out on the shelf. And it's much, much easier to make that price comparison. But your time is valuable. You have to know that and you have to believe that yourself, because if you don't believe it, nobody else is going to. Yes. On Friday, I attended a workshop for about an hour. So one of my members was giving a, uh, it was called Empowered You Empowered Money. She was working on everyone's money blocks. And I was there to vet her as a speaker for a retreat that I'm planning. And it's incredible how many blocks people have on money, whether they feel like they don't deserve it, or they'll lose uh, the connection with the people who think poorly of people that with the money or um, they're afraid of even dealing with the money or it's there's it's all over the map. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you don't like the money when you get it, you can give it all away to charity. You can do whatever you want with it. Pay your employees really well if you're not comfortable with it. Uh, but I do think that it helps. Um, you know, set a standard and a value for what your time is worth. And I think that that's really important. Okay, excellent. So the topic of this was actually how to get prospects to pay attention. Do you have any tips in that? <laughs> I, think I, I think I'm pretty, pretty good at, at getting prospects to pay attention. Um, you know, the, we could take, we could talk for 24 hours about this. Um, but I, I think the first thing is that you always have to be comfortable with marketing um, and you have to be comfortable with doing things that are a little bit off the beaten path because those are the things that tend to get noticed and it could be something like i created my own action figure uh with the launch of my book and if you give me one second i'll show you hold on i'll show the book you show the doll <laughs> this is the entrepreneur equation this is how i first met carol was on twitter actually I, uh, okay. Yeah. So this is this is my my action figure that goes with uh, the cover of the book. As you can tell, same outfit, same pink shoes that we have going on there. Uh -huh. And uh, I did this as a way to stand out. That when my book came to whether it was an editor office or a media person's office, there was a giant action figure slash fashion doll sitting on top of it. So when you're getting a hundred that look exactly the same, and this other thing comes to you, you're going to pay attention. It's something that's that's different. So I consistently um, encourage people to think about things that are different or that get people talking. Um, it's okay to push the envelope too. I mean, I, I always call it the, 
the the WTF factor that you know people are like what is going on with that um, it can be a really good thing as long as it's on brand for you you know obviously if, if you're doing something that's you know, deeply religious you know, maybe that's not a good fit for you uh, but if you have a brand that can allow you to be provocative or to do something that's unusual to get people to talk about you, um, that is very, very powerful. And I think it just needs to be a consistent mentality. As an entrepreneur, you have to be a marketer. There is no more, I'm just gonna be an entrepreneur, I'm gonna build something, people are gonna show up, and you know that's how the market works because there's too much noise out there, and we have global markets, and there, there's, just, there's just too much competition. So you have to be willing to get, to do something, you know, whether it's something crazy like an action figure, um, you know, whether it's a provocative blog post um, that gets people to pay attention. The other thing that gets people to pay attention is to be really great to them. <laughs> yeah. you know, everybody's really focused on themselves. You know, I always say people are tuned into their favorite radio station, W I I F M. what's in it for me? <laughs> That's what people care about. Like, what am I getting on, getting out of this? And if you really treat your customers well, which is something as a small business owner and an entrepreneur that you have the ability to do on a much better scale and a much larger scale than even the big brands, if you treat your customers really well, what happens? They talk about you. And they tend to hang out with people who are a lot like them. So if you're selling B2C, they're hanging out with other potential consumers. If it's B2B, they know a lot of other potential businesses that could be your target customer. And so then they become advocates for you. And so if you do something that's so great that you can get somebody to talk about like how amazing your business is, um, you know, that's gonna engender the word of mouth that's one of the most powerful ways to attract prospects. I think, you know, Jamie, that far too many business owners spend a lot of time looking for new prospects and thinking about traditional advertising and marketing when the reality is that your existing customers are the most powerful tool that you have to grow your own business, whether it's getting them to buy more frequently, whether it's selling, or whether it's having them advocate for you and becoming a either passive or active method of referral for your business. And so, you know, make it, make it an amazing, great experience that mm -hmm. you're going to want to talk about. Yes. So agree with that. Focus on the customers you have. Do you have uh, time to take, talk to a couple of my members? Of course. I yeah. A few of them are on. Sure. Um, Kristen Smedley of retinal, curing retinal blindness foundation is on Esther Hughes of elite center for elite women communicators, Laura Templeton, 30 second success. If any of you, Premium members want to come on camera, just click the join button and I will get your face on here and you can talk to Carol directly. Liz Bywater also, if you're on. And let's see who's uh, gonna join us here. All right, we got Liz Bywater coming on. Liz Bywater is a PA, has a PhD in psychology. She's a Cornell grad. She's the upcoming author of slow down to speed up and she consults with top executives on leadership hey. great hey liz hey, and uh pleased to meet another ivy league grad oh <laughs> where did you go to school i was a wharton undergrad at upenn very nice well we probably wouldn't have been friends when i was at cornell and you were at penn but i'm glad to meet you now <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you too well so listen thanks for sharing your insights um you know i work somewhat with entrepreneurs and i, I work um more so with fortune 500 execs but i think um getting recognized and demonstrating your value are things that run across the board no matter what people are trying to accomplish um one of the things that i talk to my clients about that i find very helpful is having champions and advocates I think that sort of ties into what you're saying about making sure your customers and clients are happy and let them be your, you know, your best cheerleaders. Um, do you find, you know, how important do you find that to be, making sure that you have um, people who can sing your praises uh, so that you can sort of sit there in the background and, uh, and you know, and have your brand and your credibility uh, boost happen for you? You know, it's interesting. I think that there are ways to have um, things that underscore your, your credibility 
uh, without being completely passive about it. Because I think part of the issue is that people wait for somebody else to be that champion and that advocate for them. And a lot of times that presents challenges. So you may ask somebody for a referral and the person says, absolutely be happy to refer you. And then they don't do anything. And it's because they didn't think of you in the moment or they didn't connect the dots or they got busy or whatever the reason was. And so for me, I like to be more active in that. I like to say, hey, if you wouldn't mind creating the connection with X person, putting us on the email loop, I'll even write the blurb for you. So they become your champion and your advocate, but you've in effect done all the work and you've also put yourself into that loop. So as soon as they've given you that credibility, you can pull them out of the loop and then you're relying on yourself instead of expecting somebody else to do your business for you. Um, so I think that that can be really powerful. And I also think that media credibility as your champion can also be really powerful for you too. Um, the fact that you're writing a book, you know, you get to now say, would you like to hire the person who read the book or who wrote the book? That is incredibly powerful. Um, if you've appeared on TV, if you've you know written for the Huffington Post, that kind of credibility, you know, we can debate whether or not it should give you credibility, but it does. Mm -hmm. So since that's the game that we're playing, let's take advantage of that game and know the rules and understand that that can be your initial champion for you um, is having these other affiliations. So I, I agree in principle, I like the advocacy, I like the championship, but I think that the most important thing is that you don't, that you can maybe delegate it in part, but you don't abdicate. You need to stay involved because at the end of the day, the person that you have to depend on to make your business a success is you. So if you are not in that loop, um, you're just, you know, assuming that somebody else is going to do the right thing for you. Yeah, yeah I com completely agree. And I think you're right. It's about the balance and the partnership between you and, and your champions. And, and just a little call out to Jamie, uh, to your point about getting um, media uh, coverage and so on. That that's one of the things Jamie's really helping me with in conjunction with my book is to really get out there front and center. So, uh, awesome. uh, well, I think that's a really good point. Awesome. But if you're working with Fortune 500 CEOs, use that line. Drop the book. Do you want to hire the person who wrote the book or read the book? They have huge egos. And of course, they want to hire the person who wrote the book. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Carol. I, I appreciate it. Yes. Good luck with it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. All right. Take care, Jamie. Does anyone else want to come on and ask a quick question of Carol? I think I see Kristen. Kristen, you usually jump on unless you're um, running right now. <laughs> Sometimes she calls in from where she is. She is not running. <laughs> Kristen Smedley, she is the founder of Curing Retinal Blindness Foundation. How are you, Kristen? You sound. There you go. Oh, All set? You, we can hear you. You can hear me now. I'm having such technical difficulties. I didn't know whether I should press that button or not but um hey so this is great information carol and jamie thanks for always having the the best hookups <laughs> on these on these labs but i was actually that was my question what was already asked about the i'm trying to hook up with this is so weird because just today i'm sitting here <laughs> with my piles of stuff and trying to figure out how to hook up with this big influencer that i need to get next to for a big event that we have coming up and i was debating whether to reach out myself or go through a contact that I know that knows that person well. Yes. So, so Kristen, I would definitely say if you know somebody who can create that introduction for you, again, loop yourself in on it so you can take over the follow-up, write the email if you have to, so they get the right information, but definitely have that point of connection because, you know, the influencer is going to be really, really busy and where they may want to do a favor for a friend, um, they may not be as quick to respond to you if you're just coming over the transom. So I think that you definitely want to use that connection point um, to reach the influencer. The other thing that I would say is really important is once you do make that connection, keep your focus on the what's in it for them. Um, because while influencers, um, you know, are, are very nice people <laughs> and they like to help, at the end of the day, they're really busy. 
and they're influential for a reason and they built their own community brands or whatnot and um, nobody likes to just let other people leverage off of that just for fun they have to to make a living too so even if it's not financial compensation if there's some other benefit that you can offer and, and make it clear to them that you understand that you know, their participation is you know, a, a favor or something on their side, but that they're gonna get something out of it too. I think that's really, really critical because far too many people uh, approach influencers and you know, I've been on the other side of it many times, like, hey, can you do this for me? You know, Here's why I'm great. Here's why it'd be so great for me for you to do this. <laughs> And I keep going, well, that's nice, but why should I do this? I've got, you know, I barely see my family. You know, I haven't seen my best friend in six months, yet you want me to take my like one morsel of free time and devote it to you. So what is it that you can offer them, um, you, you know, just to incentivize them? And, and even if it's something that doesn't seem like a lot on, on your side, just the gesture, the fact that you realize that their time is valuable um, you know, I think it helps soften the ask and makes people a bit more receptive to it. I love it. Perfect. Thanks so much. Jared, good luck. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, it's the best way to uh, build relationships with influencers is to shine the light on them. <laughs> give, yes, give, give first is, is always... Um, a good thing and if you're somebody who's supporting someone whether it's you know retweeting their social posts um, mentioning them in blogs you know doing things giving first uh, that always helps people too rather than just coming out of the woodwork as well uh, people do take notice of hey this person's been you know very receptive and I know I personally use that as a, a screening metric as well right now yeah. I actually met you Carol I don't know if you remember way back when but I was trying I looked at the, you know, Michael Port back then had about 10,000 followers. He probably has way more now. And he only followed about 100 people, maybe 80. And you were one of them. And I started looking <laughs> at your tweets and I was like, I like this girl. She like, tells it <laughs> like it is. So I started following you and sharing your information. And then I remember you did a teleseminar or webinar with, I think, was it with Lit Elizabeth Marshall? And we were allowed to write questions in, but I didn't ask anything relevant to the, the webinar. I said, would you like to come to Bucks County and meet the Network Now members? I, I do remember that. I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take what I can get with technology. Here. But it, <laughs> You know, I'm, I, uh, I do it all. I always, my guests are always somebody that I believe in that I think is like offers amazing value and that I feel like I can support over many years. It's not somebody that, I'm just going to like get a notch in my belt or something. I'm like always promoting Carol, whether on Twitter or Facebook or on the event post, holding up her book, <laughs> Entrepreneur Equation, My Daughter Has Your Doll. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also want to hear about your new um, program, The Future File. Yeah. Tell me about the launch of The Future File. Oh, okay. So, so we're talking about not new TV program, my, my new actual product. Yeah, let's talk about that first. Then we'll talk about the deep programs. That's fine. All right. Yes. So I would like for everyone who is on this lab live or watching the recording to go to futurefile.com and put in your email and I will send you the information once we are officially live, probably six to eight weeks. Um, but this is a product that was born out of my own personal experience and uh, to get uh, all sad here, but I've had a number of deaths in my family, um, it, it, concluding with my father, who was the fourth person close to me to pass about three years ago in a freak accident. And leading up to that, after a uh, boyfriend was killed, mom passed, stepmom passed, my father looked at my sister and I and said, you know, if something happens to me, you guys are going to have absolutely no idea what to do. So he started handing us stuff, you know, paper, like, hey, put this in the file. Hey, take, take this and put this in the file. And, um, you know, we just we kind of laughed, but we did it. And uh, my father ended up in this freak accident. And sure enough, we had to make some end of life decisions and he didn't make it. And then we had to lay the body to rest and wrap up his personal affairs. And had we not had these ongoing conversations and had we not had access to all this information, a few things would have happened. One is that I don't know that we could have lived with making the end of life decision for him. Mm -hmm. That's a huge, huge burden to bear. 
Second, it saved us so much time because the, the just trying to find the paperwork and where it was that we had to go and what it was that we had to do was a tremendous, tremendous time sink. And it actually saved us more than $10,000 because we knew exactly what my father had wanted in terms of his end of life um, arrangements. And he pre-planned for them. And he also actually took out an insurance policy so that the, the chunk of those wouldn't come out of the estate which my younger sister who lived with him really needed to, to be able to live on. So we wanted to take this and package this together as a gift to be able to, to give people you know, what our father gave us as a gift. So basically it's a, a very simple product that's first launching in hard form and the software will follow um, that allows you to put together your wishes, organize your information, and then the leave behind is a roadmap that we call the guidebook for your loved ones to follow so that if something happens to you and, you know, again, incapacitation, so it could be dementia, it could be Alzheimer's, you know, it doesn't actually have to be um, a passing, that they know exactly what to do and what steps to take and have access to everything. And uh, it's gotten just tremendous, tremendous reception. But the most important thing is that, you know, it's something that everybody needs. If you, you know, if you're 30 or older, if you have kids, if you have parents, you need this to organize because you're going to be taking care of your parents' affairs. Um, and the other thing for women that we've found as a side effect is that if you're married, um, this also helps you prepare in case you ever get divorced because now you know where all of your, your financial information is and what accounts you have and all those kinds of things. So um, you know, please, it's, 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 it's a very, very, very that unfortunately every single person is going to have to deal with on one side or the other at some point in time. It's the, the only certainty that we have wow. as soon yeah. as we're ready planning and ready to go. Life planning for death. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to be prepared. Yeah. Um, one of our members actually has a book called My Funeral, My Way, which is the same vein, but a little bit different. It's, it's her name is Angela D. Simone, and it's about how you want to be remembered. So it's about writing all yes. the things that were important to you and that you did in your life. And so that when you go to that funeral, yeah. it's not like a stranger talking about nothing. It's more personalized. Yeah. And that would be a great compliment to our program because, you know, we're, we're very focused on the roadmap, but you know, it's folks like Angela and her book, um, estate planners, wealth planners, you know, we're, we're not trying to take away other people's mm -hmm. expertise. We're trying to point people in it's the really direction good. of all that expertise. I'll have her send so, you a copy. So yeah. You can have one as a present. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so cool. let's let, you know, cool. exciting <laughs> talking about TV. That's uh you, I saw you back when you were on MSNBC, now CNBC. What is the, I haven't watched the, uh, America's Greatest Makers. You're, I have not. What? Tell me about this reality <laughs> show. Well, you need to, you need to get rock, on apparently. it. Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday nights on TBS, but you can also, you can catch up on back episodes on okay. americasgreatestmakers.com. And uh, it is a Mark Burnett production who you all know as the producer of Shark Tank, The Voice, Survivor, The Apprentice, you know, just I call it, uh, you know, kind of like the, the god of unscripted programming, so to speak. And uh, he teamed up with Intel to create a technology competition. So we have engineers, innovators, inventors, people who saw a problem and wanted to take a crack at solving it using some sort of technology with the core of that being Intel's Curie module. And we have amazing contestants. We had a 15 year old girl up through 60 year old men, um, all who basically decided that they were going to, to try and take a crack at the problem. And every week we whittle people down. Uh, we have one more spot in our semifinals. Five semifinalists each get $100,000 in mentorship from Intel. And then the winner, which will be announced on May 24th at the big finale, um, yeah. wins a million dollars. And so I am one of the permanent judges along with the CEO of Intel and Kevin Pereira from True TV. And then we get these wonderful guest judges. So we had Shaq, 
We had Mayim Bialik from Big Bang Theory. We had Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs. So, um, you know, some very cool celebs who uh, add a, a whole bunch of, of different wow, perspectives into yes. what we're doing. I promise I will watch. Yeah. Until I will. I <laughs> will. Any, uh, anyone have any last questions? Any premium members have any last questions regarding how to get on TV, how to get influencers to pay attention to you, how to get prospects to pay attention to you, how to do your business and not do it all yourself, how to have a life with a business, how to charge what you're worth. Oh, any of those topics are Carol's. Or, or fantasy football questions. I won oh, my wow. league last year, so I can are also Are you a Bears fan, Chicago yeah. girl? Uh, yes, a long-suffering Bears fan and also a former I'm Raiders back. fan as well. Again. So it's a, a rough time, rough Fraud. time over in the Roth, Liz Roth household. Liz I'm coming on back. Yeah. yeah. Back. Yay. All right. She liked it. Carol, she I have so a question for you, the actually. First time. She's, She's so no One of the things that I really am focusing on beyond <laughs> kind of delivering the, the work for my clients is building my yeah. brand and my thought leadership and my visibility. And it sounds like you have had a lot of success in – um, becoming visible and known in a variety of media. So Jamie had mentioned, you know, maybe some guidance on how to get get your face on TV and how to. And for me, it would be probably primarily a business yeah. audience, but it doesn't have to be that. My book is applicable actually to to anybody who wants to become more successful and more effective in their lives. So, uh, any couple of little tips that you might be able to share? Yeah. So your your easiest entry point is going to be through your local. Community yeah. Yeah. Or other yeah, so your, your easiest entry point is going to be through your local news or other local news. Um, I would suggest watching the broadcasts. I would suggest seeing yeah. what kind of a segment um, they might typically do that is you know similar, not the same as what you're doing, but similar, and whether you fit in to you know some sort of a, a psychological segment they're doing or financial mm -hmm. or whatnot. And then what you always want to do is understand that they're trying to deliver right. value to their audience. So you can't be saying, you know, here's me, here's me, and do a feature on me. It's really providing tips for their audience um, around something that makes sense. And it could be tied to the calendar. You know, it could be uh, you know, 10 ways, you know, for Memorial Day to do something or 4th of July to do something. Um, but it, it, it could be just, you know, sort of an evergreen set of tips. And you want to have those tips very quickly and bulleted, you know, well-known author and, you know, CEO of Fortune 500 gives five tips for this. Here mm -hmm. are my five tips, you know, would love to come on. Um, they don't have a lot of time. They get a ton of pitches. And so it has to really stand out to them from the title and from the five bullets. Uh, if you do, if you've done media before, you can also put a link in to, you know your previous media experience but i think that that's sort of the best place for you to get your feet wet is by doing something that um you know sometimes has a financial or business focus and also has like you said a more broad appeal um and uh, and work your way up from there the thing that you have to know take a look at you know through um through their newsroom um or on their website and make sure that you're contacting the right people you want to be contacting the people who are the producers either for the segment that you're going after um, or yeah. in some local newscasts it's just you know a general producer but a lot of times the anchors have nothing to do with it yeah. journalists who cover other topics have I'm nothing sure. to do with it so don't harass people that aren't relevant which yeah. I can tell you happens all the time um, and be prepared yeah. to pitch over and over again because you know if it just didn't hit that day there was a busy news day it doesn't mean they didn't like it. It just means it didn't hit. And try different variations of your headline and your tips and, and whatnot. But just, you know, just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Um, the other cheats, and it, you know, kind of depends on how much money you mm -hmm. want to spend. Um, one of the things that I did early on is I hired a pay-for-play PR firm. So basically a PR firm that you only pay if you get the hit. Now, it's much more expensive on a per-hit basis, um, but it's guaranteed you're not paying unless you get it. And so I wanted to get like one or two things just kind of nailed down so that I could leverage myself and see how it went. And so for me, having that guarantee up front is great. And I recommend a firm out of Florida okay. called EMSI, 
um, you can call Marsha Friedman and tell her that I sent you. Uh, and, and they're very competent and they can do that both from a radio perspective as well as from a local mid-tier and national news perspective as well as from a print perspective. And again, it's, it's um, not cheap, but again, you get what you pay for. And so it's, you're not hiring a PR firm and waiting six months and yeah. finding out maybe they got you something, maybe they didn't. So I, I, I wanted that guarantee. <laughs> and so I did that early on mm -hmm. and then used those contacts and you know, once that, I that's the great people, advice. And it's, it really sounds myself. like that's a, a so terrific just investment. A it gets you yeah. that, so that foundation you that you can build off of. Yeah, take it away from you. I, yeah. I literally did a radio tour with them before we did my morning radio. Can't take it away from you. I, I literally did a radio tour with them where we did like 40 radio shows in 30 days or something. So it literally looked like I've been doing radio for years and it was literally over 30 days. So That's fantastic, it's all about thank you the so much. perception and, Jamie, you and, I and how you <laughs> repackage it and put it back out there. All right, thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> Bye, Liz. All right, I don't think anyone else is joining us. Um, for the person that just tried to click through, I only allow my uh, publicity clients and premium members on camera, so I apologize for rejecting your request. So Carol. Um, <laughs> but we love, but we love you anyway, and we're sending you hearts and love. Anything else you want to add, Carol? <laughs> Yeah, you know that's a that's a lot of stuff to digest. Um, I think that the only other thing that I would say, which is is really important, and it kind of goes back to what Liz was talking about, um, in a sense, is that remember to focus on ROI, which is return on investment, versus ROE, return on ego. And I say this because we live in this world, you know, where it is great to be an expert and where you can get validation from social media likes and whatnot. But there are far too many people spending too much time on things that eventually will not lead to increasing your business. It's important to get some level of validation, like for Liz, really important for her to get on TV, write her book. But at some point, getting on TV for the hundredth time, unless she wants to be a TV personality, isn't going to help her anymore. So you really have to look at what it is your goal and what, what it is that you're trying to achieve and saying, it was doing this, this time, going to get me over that hump? Is, is this really the best use of my time in order for me to reach my goal? Or should I be spending my, my time elsewhere? And it's really fun and um, you know feels good to get the social media share or to see yourself on television. But if that's not the core of what you do for a living, at some point you get the diminishing returns. So really stay focused on what it is that's going to help you accomplish that goal as well as your return this on it. This is Laura Templeton, her Hi, company's 30 Seconds Success. Hi, Laura. Um, thank you so much, Carol. The, everything that you've shared was so Hi, Laura. awesome yeah. and wonderful. I, I can't even Good. think that I have any yeah. questions to ask you. But um, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this information with Jamie. She's been an amazing support system for so many of us in network now. And loved hearing what you had to say regarding branding and building your your, your relationships. That's it's a key factor in what I'm doing with my business, just really building those relationships and getting to meet the right people. Um, one quick question, and maybe you can just clarify this for me, is when you were – developing your business and building a brand and you, you start looking to, to different mentors to help you to escalate your business, how do you suggest picking the right person for you? Okay, so I'm very, I'm very contrarian on everything, but I'm very contrarian on the whole concept of mentorship. I do not believe that most people will ever find mentors in the way that most people think about mentors. I call them the mythical mentors. And that is the person who's the millionaire, billionaire, guy or gal who's going to take you under their wing and go, here, I'm going to show you the secrets to success and we're going to build your business and you're going to be a great, like that just doesn't happen. What I believe in is the five minute mentoring. And that is opportunities like this, where you get to interact with somebody who's been successful, 
you know, take a nugget and go and leverage it, or you have a friend who can provide that introduction to that key influencer. So I think that most of the time it's being aware of the situations and going, okay, what is it that I really learned here? And now I'm going to go apply it because a lot of people have the opportunity to sit in and hear things like this, but very few people do anything with it. They go, Oh my God, that's such great advice. And then they show up for the next one and they still haven't done anything with that, that previous information. So it, again, really incumbent upon you um, to take it to the next level. I would say if you do end up in a relationship that goes towards mentoring, I think it just happens organically. I think that when people have a great relationship and you reach out to somebody and you connect with them and they do something for you and you're, you're grateful and you try to be helpful back and you build up that relationship, that sometimes those you know more formalized relationships happen organically. But I can tell you personally, I've had maybe thousands of people ask me to be their mentor and I've said yes to exactly zero of them because it just doesn't work that way. There, there's no like formal application process. I'm not looking to formally be committed to somebody, but people call me up all the time and send me emails and I answer questions and I catch people and I do things for people. And, um, and there are a lot of people who will, cons who, if you ask them, say, say Carol Roth is my mentor, even though I would say that I don't have any formal re mentorship relationships with anybody. And so I, I think that that's the, the difference is just that the level of expectation, the way that you go about it. And so if you're open to being mentored, you know, 24 seven, I think that you'll have a lot of learnings from all different kinds of people. And then you can kind of pick and choose the best for you. Um, that inform you because you know at the end of the day what worked for one person doesn't necessarily work for you that the failures always you know seem to come down to the same things to avoid but the successes are very very individualized based on your own goals and objectives so I would say just just changing gotcha. your thinking I mean, about that advice. will Thank probably you so get much. you and much more mentorship than it. you ever thought Thank possible <laughs> thanks yeah. you're welcome yeah, Laura's My doing pleasure. a lot Good of the luck. right things. She comes on the blabs every month and she takes advantage of her calls with me and she steps up into leadership opportunities. She's doing what she needs to be doing. So it's good. Um, Love it. Yeah, your point about execution, awesome. uh, Carol, I was flipping through your book for the hundredth time. And <laughs> you, the, one, the one line that yeah. stood out the most for me was that ideas, the idea is just the starting point and what you do afterwards, the execution is what creates the value. Love that. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I will tell you, Jamie, I tell people this all of the time that I will take a stupid idea with brilliant execution any day over a great idea with poor execution. I mean, if you if, just think about the Snuggie, right? It's a backwards bathrobe. Like they, they didn't even innovate. They just go bathrobe, put it on backwards hundred plus million dollar product because it was it was executed flawlessly say the same thing about starbucks coffee when starbucks came about you could get coffee anywhere it was in your home it was at every you know 7-eleven and convenience store mcdonald's it was not something it was difficult to find so the idea of putting a store that's going to sell coffee at like 10 times the price on every corner was just a stupid idea flawlessly executed. They continue to execute almost flawlessly to today. So um, ideas, you know, you know, unless you've got something like totally crazy, like shoes that can fly, uh, most of the time the idea is not really uh, what you're yes. betting on. You're betting we once on had a member who wouldn't tell yeah. us what her business was going to be, what her idea was. I said, we can't help you if you don't share. It's not the idea <laughs> that matters. It's the execution. <laughs> so. No. No, and actually, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. You never really want to be the first person with the idea anyway, because sure. then you spend all of your money educating the people. You want to be the person that goes into the educated market and does it better. So if you think about search engines of today, Google and Bing, um, you know, they were not the first search engines. You had Lycos, no. you had Netscape, you had Ask Jeeves, you had all of these other ones. Um, and, you know, the, these guys just did it better. So it's it's never it's never about the idea. And the, the nice thing about sharing ideas is that when you get feedback that can help make your idea better, but you also get buy it. And so if people mm -hmm. give their feedback, they feel like they have ownership of your idea and ownership vested in your success and they're more likely to help you. So, so I think this is our away. last question. She didn't come on yeah. camera again, but Kristen Smedley wrote, Do you have suggestions to leverage media appearances? 
Yes. So I'm so glad that you asked that, Kristen, because it it is so much about the leverage. Um, You know, very few people, you know, just their core audience are going to see your your media appearance, but that doesn't mean that your target customer saw it. So um, I say be the biggest self-promotion person you could ever think of and put it everywhere. Put it on social media put a link to it in the, the tag of your email, your, your, um, your, what do you call it, the footer of your email, where it says, you know, see me on, you know, CBS News talking about blah, 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 link. Like literally don't miss an opportunity to put it somewhere and to do it over and over again, because even on social media, people miss it. You know, I love Twitter, but you know, if you don't have me on Twitter within the last hour of my last tweet, um, unless they're stalking me, which lots of people do, but not everybody does, uh, you're going to end up missing that. So I'll take the same tweet, you know, change up the title and the phrasing a little bit and, you know, send it out multiple times over multiple days. So once you get you know, any sort of media placement, any sort of accolade shared in multiple channels. Um, if you have trusted friends and influencers who can share it, you know, sometimes that's a good strategy. You know, early on, I used to do that, be like, hey, psst, you know, so and so, could you share this out? This was kind of a big deal for me. And if you're reciprocal, most people have no problem doing those kinds of things. Um, so anywhere that you could possibly stick it, if you have a website, stick it front and center on your website as seen on, you know, CBS News, you plaster it there, you put it in a blog post. I mean, like anything, any place that you could potentially stick that thing, a screen grab of your face, a link to the video, do it. And there's a great... Um, little tool and it's an extension if you use Firefox called Download Helper. And this is something that helps you to grab video online from sources where you normally can't grab it. Um, So not that I would authorize using other people's intellectual property inappropriately, um, but for, you know, your own purposes, if you grab it and, you know, put it on YouTube or somewhere else so that you have it just in case it goes away on their platform, (laughs) you know, never, never a bad idea. I always, I always ask so for think, forgiveness later. Like, oh, I saw what I did something wrong. I was just trying to I knew I liked it. you for a reason. I say that all the time. Don't ask for permission. <laughs> ask for forgiveness. So what about- yeah. <laughs> yeah, forgiveness always. Because <laughs> if you ask for permission, then they can say no. But if so you ask for forgiveness, like, yeah, it's too late. You already you accomplished what you wanted. <laughs> so how- Yes. So put a, put a listing on your website. So you should have like a, a press page on your website. You should have um, and where you can like list them. And if you have links, if they have the podcast, you can actually link to up. But as appeared on, do, 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 do. and then if you pick the most high profile one, you can, if you want to call that out, maybe on your homepage, you know, it's heard on, you know, blah, 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 or is seen and heard on if you've done, you know, any sort of video kind of things. Um, but you should definitely have a oh, press page. That. Again, you can see it in the footer of your email for your favorite one or a couple of them um i haven't gone that far yet yeah, but i was just close. just I keep close throwing them where it's your shirt <laughs> I've heard all the selfies and all and, you know and i have a picture of me at the microphone at kyw news and all that Per, you should, yeah, you should definitely use they and you know, in the footer of your email, um, and if you don't want to list them all, you could also, if you have a lot of them, I always like to use numbers for scale, you know, as heard on more than 40 national media outlets, including CBS. So then it's like they see the one and they know it's more than 40. <laughs> they and they're like, oh my gosh, you've been more than 40. Okay, wow, oh my gosh, she must be an expert. <laughs> I'm, I was the expert. Actually, oh, what, 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 wait, 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 wait. What did you say? You're not an expert? So much fun. No, just kidding. No, no, no. Now, why, why, are, why, are you not, a, why are you not an expert, Kristen? I don't like hearing this. Very good. You Very are good. an expert. If you know your domain, you're an expert. Is. Own it. Never apologize for it. Promise, promise me that. Promise me that you are you it. are the expert in your Perfect. domain. I'm gonna tweet it. And there, there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Own it. <laughs> Woo! Did, Kristen yes. is called many out times. Carol. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, well, 
It's awesome. A little tough love. No, a little tough I love. I think what Kristen probably meant was that she was a teacher and then by circumstance became. So that's why maybe you said it. But you are the expert. It does. It does. No, but this, but this is the problem, mm -hmm. and this is a problem that women do all the time. That, oh no, I'm not really the. Yes, you are. And any other dude would go on one time and and, and basically yeah. stay claim that I am the expert. And you probably really actually have that expertise, so you need to claim that as well. Uh, if you anyone's an expert on something that they have deep domain experience on, so regardless of what your background was. If you're now in that domain and you have something to share, mm -hmm. you have expert insight. So you, you should not feel bad um, or feel the need to apologize. You should never feel the need to apologize for anything, by the way. Um, and again, women do this all the time. Oh, I'm working on this thing. It's not that interesting. Or, oh, this may sound silly, but or I'm not, I haven't do it, done it that long. Like, stop. If you don't believe it, I'm not going to believe it. So that's the tone that you said. I remember somebody on TV once came up to me and said, oh, you're so incredibly smart. You know, you seem to just know every single topic. And I said, well, I say everything very confidently. So <laughs> at the end of the day, you don't know whether I have no idea what I'm talking about or not, because I said it confidently. You believe that I know it. That end, end of story. So the fact, again, that if you actually have the expertise, you should be willing to double down on that because your level of confidence sets the tone for every interaction. So if you're going to go out and, and connect with that influencer, you can't be apologetic. There's nothing to apologize for. You are out building something in your domain that you know about that you're uniquely suited to do. So own that and communicate that and, and, and feel good about that. And, and this is to, to all of the women out there, don't apologize. If, unless you made a mistake, unless you did something bad to somebody you, that you need to apologize you know to them for, that? never apologize for anything. Honestly, There's nothing just macro that, that you need to apologize are for. Ever, successful. period. And I was an expert at step one. That's why I was asked to be there. And that's what I talked about was all I had was step one and how I did it. And now I'm only on step two. So I was, you know, I wasn't like Huge. I was in this forever. Huge. It hurt. Yeah. Yeah. But how, but how powerful to people who are at step zero and the people who are at step 30 probably don't even remember step one. So you have a very, very important piece of the pie to deliver. And without step one, you don't get to step two. So it's the most yeah, important funny, step the, out of all of those. You can't be successful in step 30 step if you haven't conquered step thought, one. Oh my gosh. I really did have something key for, for the folks that were in there. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot from, I was taking notes from the big guys, you know, but no, good stuff. You do. Win win. And again, remember that success is all relative. It's based on your own goals and objectives. So you can't measure somebody else's success Thanks and compare it to yours. They're apples and oranges. So don't don't even try to do that. Yeah. You're the best, Carol. I can't even <laughs> stand it. Esther, are you coming on or are we moving on, girl? I'm, sla I'm slapping your members. Oh, no, you're awesome. right. we'll oh yay. One last into, member. Into That's a success. You're, you're being so generous, Carol. I really appreciate it. <laughs> the last time, a few years ago, you came on and did a teleseminar for members, and it was like 45 right? minutes of How are you? genius. It was amazing. Hey, Esther. So this is Esther Hughes of the Center for Elite Women Communicators. She's all about public speaking. So she probably loves hey, that Carol, confidence message. Hey, Carol, this is message. great. I am like awesome. learning so much from you and you're so generous and I thank you <laughs> oh, for hey, that. Esther, how are you? I love how you said not to be, did you say it not to be a price slut? Is, I, I, okay, I keep hearing this so I know I have to change my pricing a because I am Don't not give kidding away you for in the last free. couple of weeks. I'm Get hearing charged. this message and whenever you hear that message you know someone's trying to tell you something so uh and i wasn't coming on because i'm in a fleece and a t-shirt but when you said you don't have to apologize for anything yes. i'm like okay i'm freezing in my office so <laughs> i threw a fleece on to keep me warm so my question i know Wait, by the way by the way esther I didn't even notice. So had you not pointed that out to me and everybody else, we wouldn't have known. And that's my whole point about apologizing. If you don't tell me this stuff, 
I have no idea. I'm, all I heard hey, was that, that you were both elite for a sailor. That's, for that's sailing. my focus. So, now I'm focused on your goddamn fleece. <laughs> Yeah. Remember what you're putting out there. All I want to know is that you're doing. No, and that's actually what I tell stuff. my communicators Don't all the time. Get, because looks, they'll always get up and they'll cute. say, oh, I'm, I'm really no sorry. I have this. a cold. I'm sorry. And I'm like, they don't know that you have a cold unless you're sneezing all over them. Then you can apologize, you know. But other than that, so I totally agree with you. My question today is, as a speaker, so you're, you're obviously a dynamic communicator, clearly. Uh, I can just see that. What would you say to women out there who are trying to get more speaking engagements? They're just starting up because this is the question that I get a lot of times, but you're much further ahead of me in that realm of, um, you know, leadership with your best selling book. How would you tell women to get out there, entrepreneurs in general, how they can get out there at the very beginning as a speaker? Because uh, what I find is that speaking, it doubles my list right away, right away. It gives you the credibility, it gives you the visibility, and it helps increase the profitability. So how, can you just give us a little insight as to how you do it and do it so well? Yes. So I think that the first thing with anything that you want to do is that you have to let everybody you know, know that that's what you want to do. If, if that's what you're very focused on, when you're reconnecting with people, when you're putting out there, you need to say, hey, just so you know, I'm really focused on giving speeches on X and Y. And if you know anybody who's looking for that, I, you know, I, I'm willing to do it you know, no compensation. This is the one time in the beginning when you're building up, you can start doing it for free to, to, to cut your teeth and to get that credibility and eventually leverage yourself into paid. But I, I'm all for, you know, at the beginning, you, you, your compensation is having you know, the, the verification and the practice um, and put the word out there because there are a lot of venues who don't have big budgets or in some cases don't have any budgets and they cannot get the speakers that they would like to have. And so they're looking at um, you know different opportunities. The other things, you know, think about maybe serving on some panels first before you're doing keynotes, you know, something that gets you in the flow that gets you exposed to people who are organizing, that lets you practice in a little bit more comfortable arena. But there are so many small venues, whether it be through your local chamber of commerce, um, with SCORE, with you know, co-working spaces. There are everybody who's looking for some sort of an edge. So go to your local co-working space, propose a topic, say, I'm happy to do this. You know, pro bono is you know a, a, a boon for your members, something for you to market. And, and get the word out there and tell everybody you know and just start doing them. Um, I also say if you get the opportunity, if you can have somebody videotape it for you, um, even if it's not a good quality, one, you will be able to see yourself and, and kind of assess yourself and learn from it. Uh, but also then you can cut a little bit of it, put it on your speakers page, which of course you should put on your website that you are a speaker so people can find you uh, if they're doing keyword searches. Um, but then it gives a little videotape so somebody can look at you and say, yeah, that person is, is a competent um, speaker because that's, you know, that's the fear, right? From somebody who's booking you as a speaker, they don't want you to get up there and not be very good and not be very interesting. Um, so maybe start with shorter amounts, do a, a 20 or 30 minute keynote to start, start with panels, um, you do, do things that again are, you know, local, localized so that you don't have as big of a hurdle for both yourself and for the organizers. And then it's like everything else. It's bait. It's steps. You, you conquer that first small one and then you leverage that to the next big one, the next big one, the next big, big one. What I will say is that as you move up the ladder, at some point when you feel confident about it, that you've got, you know, the great speaking skills that you're delivering, everything on point is that then you should start asking to be paid because that becomes the issue is too many people just being willing to do it for free. Now, if it's a great 
you know, lost leader for your business, if it's a marketing choice and that works really well to deliver sales, then maybe you never need to charge. But you need to be still doing that calculation to make sure that you're getting something of value out of it. Um, in the beginning, you're getting the practice, you're getting the exposure, you're getting the the referral out of it. That's but really at some good. point, if, if you, you, you know, you if so you much. really start making it, Thanks, then Jamie. you transition into being paid. Yeah. You're welcome. I'll take care. Thank you. All right, Carol. This has been this has been fabulous. Thank you so much. All righty. Sorry, um, my son is yelling at me. Okay, perfect way to end the teenager. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> and that and that's and that's the modern lives that we live in. Well, uh, Jamie, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It's amazing members. Great questions, and uh, and I hope that all of this was very very helpful and that you apply something. So so find out. So think about everything that we talked about. Take that, whatever that one thing is that most resonates with you and be very clear about how you're going to apply that in the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, um, because otherwise it ends up being Everybody a wasted get out opportunity there and there's nothing I progress. hate more than a wasted opportunity, Jamie. All right. Thanks, Carol. See ya. <laughs> All right. Keep me posted. Bye.